darkness falls across the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. Creatures crawl in search of blood to terrorize your neighborhood. And whosoever shall be found without the soul for getting down must stand and face the hounds of hell and rot inside a corpse's shell. The demons squeal in sheer delight. It's you they spy, so plump, so right. For although the groove is hard to beat, it's still you stand with frozen feet. You try to run, you try to scream, but no more sun you'll ever see. For evil reached up from the crypt to crush you in its icy grip. The foulest stench is in the air, the funk of forty thousand years, and grisly ghouls from every tomb are closing in to seal your doom. And though you fight to stay alive, your body starts to shiver. For no mere mortal can resist the evil of the thriller. <laughs> dark as a stone in this room, and hot as a roasted heart. If you stare into the darkness with your eyes open, you're sure to see something after a time. I hope it is not flowers. But this is the time they like to grow, the red flowers. The shining red peonies, which are like satin which are like splashes of paint. <laughs> the soil for them is emptiness. It is empty space and silence. I whisper, talk to me, because I would rather have talking than the slow gardening, which takes place in silence. With the red petals dripping down the wall. Laszlo was afraid of the dark. The dark lived in the same house as Laszlo, a big place with a creaky roof, smooth cold windows, and several flights of stairs. Sometimes the dark hid in the cupboard. Sometimes it sat behind the shower curtain. But mostly it spent its time in the basement. All day long the dark would wait in a distant corner, far from the squeaks and rattles of the washing machine, pressed up against some old damp boxes and a chest of drawers nobody ever opened. At night, of course, the dark went out and spread itself against the windows and doors of Laszlo's house. But in the morning, the dark would be back in the basement where it belonged. Laszlo would peek at the dark every morning. Hi, he would say. Hi, dark. Laszlo thought that if he visited the dark in the dark's room, maybe the dark wouldn't come and visit him in his room. But one night, it did. Laszlo, the dark said in the dark. The voice of the dark was as creaky as the roof of the house and as smooth and cold as the windows, and even though the dark was right next to Laszlo, the voice seemed far away. What do you want? asked Laszlo. I want to show you something, said the dark. In here? No, said the dark. Here? No, no, said the dark. Downstairs. Downstairs? Yes, said the dark. In Laszlo's living room was the biggest window in the house. 
Laszlo looked out at all the dark outside. Above him, the roof creaked, and he closed his eyes. Now the dark was all Laszlo could see. No, no, said the dark again. Not there, down here. In the basement? asked Laszlo. Yes, said the dark. Laszlo had never dared come to the dark's room at night. Come closer, said the dark. Laszlo came closer. Even closer, said the dark. You might be afraid of the dark, but the dark is not afraid of you. That's why the dark is always close by. The dark peeks round the corner and waits behind the door, and you can see the dark up in the sky almost every night, gazing down as you gaze up at the stars. Without a creaky roof, the rain would fall on your bed, and without a smooth, cold window, you could never see outside, and without a flight of stairs, you could never go into the basement where the dark spends its time. Without a cupboard, you would have nowhere to put your shoes. And without a shower curtain, you would splash water all over the bathroom. And without the dark, everything would be light, and you would never know if you needed a light bulb. Bottom drawer, said the dark. What? Bottom drawer, said the dark. Open the bottom drawer. Thank you said Laszlo. You're welcome, said the dark. By the time Laszlo got back into bed, the dark was no longer in his room, except when he closed his eyes to go to sleep. The next morning, Laszlo visited the dark in the basement. Hi, he said. Hi, dark. The dark didn't answer, but the bottom drawer was still open, so it looked like something in the corner was smiling. The dark kept on living with Laszlo, but it never bothered him again. I live in a house with no windows. A black curtain hangs on my door. The voices of conscience torment me. I live in a room with no floor. There's dirt in the corner I can't see. There's water that runs down the wall. There are mice in the attic above me and rats playing games in the hall. I live in a house with no windows and sleep in a room with no heat. The darkness of life that surrounds me keeps out the sounds of the street. I wake when the shadows have fallen and walk when the memories cease. When purpose in life has no meaning and only the wicked find peace. Each night you sense that I'm by you. You feel my breath as you sleep. You hear the faint creak of the floorboards as out from the shadows I creep. I live in a house with no windows. I live in a house that's now yours. It's my voice you think that you're hearing, for I died in this room with no doors. <laughs> Happy Halloween. Your hands are as cold as ice, he told her, taking them into his own to try warming them. The waitress came to the table and looked at him with relative disinterest. <sighs> What'll it be? She sighed. Well, I'll have a piece of cherry pie and she'll have a devil's food milkshake hold the whip, he said cheerfully, grinning up at the waitress. The waitress looked around for a moment and looked as if she had a question for him, but was too tired. So she gave up and just mumbled, coming right up, and walked away from the table. This was the same diner that they used to meet up at for late night chats about life, the universe, and everything. He and Alex had grown apart these past few years. By her choice, Ken respected her wishes but he knew that there would never be another Alex. So he waited patiently, hoping that someday she might change her mind. 
She called him tonight. Out of the blue, and his heart skipped a beat. She wanted to meet at their special place. She wanted to talk. She poured out her every thought, and he his own ponderings and hopes and dreams. Sitting across from her at the table, he smiled at her happily. He could see sadness behind her eyes. Hey, Al. What made you call? He finally asked. He could see her shoulders drop and her expression turn to sorrow as she stammered, trying to get the words out. I... I... I, I just... I needed you to know. You mean so much to me. And I pushed you away. I want you to know that I will always love you. And I hope you can forgive me. I'm sorry. He held her hands and smiled reassuringly. We both know that there will never be another you. And of course I forgive you. We'll figure it out, he assured her. He paid the bill and they walked arm in arm until the alley before her place. He stopped to tie his shoe. He looked up and Alex was gone. Then he remembered the shoe and high prank that she used to pull so she could win foot races. And he grinned and raced down the alley and around the corner. He was greeted by blue lights. Panic set in. He saw a line of police tape across the doorway to Alex's place, and he rushed immediately forward. An officer stopped him. Sir, you can't go in there. It's a crime scene. Crime? What happened? Is Alex all right? He sputtered. The officer's face twinged with a pang of sadness. The resident, Alexandra Simon, was killed approximately three hours ago. Seems to us like a robbery gone wrong. It wasn't possible. He shook his head. He had spent the last three hours with her. And so he stared into nothingness until the officer finally made him sit in a chair they'd found. Ken's thoughts swam with disbelief until he finally remembered. She had called him. He checked his call log. Long distance caller. Name. Unknown. True. Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I had been, and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken, and observe how healthily, how calmly, I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually... I made up my mind to take the life of the old man, and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded. With what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, 
I put in a dark lantern, all closed. Closed so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ha! <laughs> would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously. Cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone, and inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man, indeed, to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea. And perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness for the shutters were close fastened through fear of robbers, and so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in, and was about to open the lantern, when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in the bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still, and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief, oh no! It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew that sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it had welled up from my own bosom, deepening, with its dreadful echo, the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt, and pitied him although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. Or, it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes. He had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain. All in vain! Because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, 
stealthily, until at length a single dim ray, like the thread of the spider, shot from out the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue, with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. And now, have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the senses? Now, I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous. So I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart might burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart. For what had I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves, with perfect suavity, as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled. For what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search. Search well. I led them, at length, to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. 
In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room, and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat, and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued, and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definitiveness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles, in a high key, and with violent gesticulations. But the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men. But the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards. But the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no. They heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark, louder, 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 louder. Villains! I shrieked. Dissemble no more! I admit the deed! Tear up the plagues! Here! Here! It is the beating of his hideous heart! 